So before anything, I would really like to give a special thanks to all of you that are subscribed to my channel and all of you new just clicking on these videos for whatever reason that may be. And again, another special thanks to my patrons who have shown great support of me. I got a bunch of new patrons because a lot of people are eager to see my four part series on the most controversial subjects. And it actually really helps me out a lot and I really do appreciate it because uh, as many of you know, and I know it's not all about the money and all that jazz, but I was demonetized and I have to try to reapply in a month because of I just teasing the subjects in that trailer. Uh, very controversial stuff, uh, so definitely check out the link in that's pinned below to, so you can see what's up with that. But I also want to give thanks to another channel real quick, and a couple of things. I want to bring a couple things out in the open here. Uh, I need to give a special thanks that's overdue for a ch pretty much giving me a good summary and inspiration to make my Bjork Stalker video, uh, you know, Ricardo Lopez, and the channel's called Hide and Seek, run by a guy named Caden. And he, said, he shot me an email because I, I promised to give him a shout out and credit him. And I actually neglected to do so, and I forgot about that. And he was very, very polite and professional. It's just he's just, he's running, you know, he's just trying to grow a channel. It's similar to mine. Um, I would say though that he has already covered a lot more vast topics. That's a lot that you're familiar with, including one of my favorites he did was about the Jonestown massacre. Uh, I definitely recommend checking out his channel and definitely showing some love and support. I just, if you're watching this man, I just run a real busy real life life, if you will. Um, sometimes a lot of things slip my mind, including video requests that I've been telling people for a long time too. So I do apologize. I had full intentions of doing as I promised and I am all for supporting smaller creators of bigger creators whatever so definitely drop into the discord and uh, support your stuff there you're allowed to advertise your work in my discord absolutely but you know we're here for a reason we're, we're here to talk about the guy the man who's stealing your wife's attention the guy who's making our daughters wet themselves in excitement like a Beatles concert no, seriously, the Beatles concerts would reek of piss because of all the girls wetting themselves, I guess, in excitement. That's a fun tidbit of fact. Grody. So we're gonna talk about someone who is making all the girls wet right now, apparently. And nothing says, <laughs> nothing says romance in an age of striding for sexual equality and safety and respecting women than rape and murder, right? You know, nothing speaks for it better than that. That's right, we're talking about our loving sex god, Richard Ramirez, also known as the second California Night Stalker. Richard has a total of 13 murders, five attempted murders to his name, along with 14 burglaries and 11 sexual assaults. What a guy. Recently though, he's been in the limelight of all the weird alt tumbler people fetishizing serial killers all over again. and. He's really been coming out into the limelight in that aspect, so I kind of figured I'd give a little fan service to a lot of people I have been asked to talk about him. Uh, let's dive into the case a little bit and talk about what made him a monster, what happened, and let's talk about a little bit of the fanaticism behind it, huh? I mean, who wouldn't want to do the horizontal monster mash with this sweaty edgelord? I mean, look at him. But before we talk about all that fun stuff, let's dive into his past a little bit. And figure out what went on in that, uh, that sweaty box of a head of his. Richard Ramirez was born on February 29th of 1960 in El Paso, Texas, and often was physically abused by his father. Which, by the way, Pisces, Pisces ladies, he's a Pisces. You don't want none of that mess. I had a leap year day, too. Ugh. His father was a former police officer in Mexico, and R Richard was the youngest out of five children, and I guess at that, that just made him suffer the ass end of all the abuse. And it's really unfortunate, but uh, there's more to this than just daddy hit me. Starting at about 10 years old, he would often spend time in the company of his older cousin, Miguel Ramirez, also known as Mike, or Mikey. He was a decorated Green Beret and veteran of the Vietnam War, and oh, <laughs> he brought back souvenirs! He, he would just kind of fascinate Richard with stories of his war crimes and just smoke, you know, just smoke weed with him. And, and basically, he would just show him pictures and stuff that he took and were taken of him during the war of women he raped, uh, 
mutilated bodies and even him holding up a severed head of a woman he abused and it's like you know you're exposing a 10 year old to that that's gonna obviously have some damage there but what really is this really the defining moment that made our edgy boy an edgy boy probably at least he says it is but there's a lot more to this than that as well and it's <laughs> It's a lot. So Lieutenant Dan, also known as Mike, was basically just your typical movie-style crazy Vietnam veteran who was just so fascinated with the atrocities he committed in the war that he sucked Richard into this world of gore, macabre in imagery, and just debauchery of treating women and humans in general. And that really obviously had an effect on his psyche, and it was around this time as well, up until age 12, that he, Richard would sleep in cemeteries, the local cemetery, to avoid contact with his father at night did, so he wouldn't get beat and stuff. So combine the abuse of his father with, um, well, just exposure to intoxicants early as well as horrible graphic imagery and stories from someone that he idolized obviously would mold him into a negative person. This, in my opinion, already, and we're nowhere near the end of it yet, this is already a... Uh, made to kill versus a born to kill type scenario. So in May of 1973, Richard was actually present when his cousin Mike uh, shot his wife fatally in the face during an altercation, some sort of domestic dispute thing. And this really affected Richard and actually put him into more of a shut off, standoffish state with his family. He was more reclusive at this point, and it's when he started dabbling in LSD and Satanism, apparently. <laughs> oh boy. Disclaimer though, his views on Satanism are pretty warped, even coming from a Levian, like, a atheistic perspective or a theistic practicing perspective. No matter which way you look at it, Richard Ramirez's definition of Satanism was pure edgelord. It's, uh, it's like totally on par with like the cringe end of the black metal community. It's pretty, it, it was pretty bad. A lot of it made no sense and was very misinformed, but hey, I just want to give a disclaimer there. Don't be blaming Satan for this, uh, this guy's actions. I don't think it's Satan. I think it's just an idiot. Richard moved in with his sister and her husband, Roberta, who was a well-known peeping Tom, I guess, and he would include Richard in his, like, nighttime escapades, which is kind of fucked up if you really think about it, because back then, I guess, <laughs> this was more normalized. This is, like, in the uh, late 70s, I guess, so <laughs> it's really messed up how that was just kind of like, a, oh, you, you stay out of my window and watching my family. Like, now it's like, that's gonna get you killed nowadays. <laughs> but this is also something that really factored into making... Richard delve into his sexual fantasies and his perversions, including uh, fantasies of rape and bondage and things like that. And I mean, obviously on the surface, bondage is fine and things like that, but you know, this isn't exactly, that wasn't exactly Richard's forte. He wasn't going for tie you down and flog you. He was going for uh, a lot worse stuff. <laughs> This apparently got so bad with his fantasies and the like that he, when he finally landed a job, still being under the age of 18 at a Holiday Inn, he ended up breaking into a room with a woman in it and her husband was away and attempted to rape her. Well, her husband interjected in this encounter and beat him to a pulp very badly, but they apparently lived out of state, so what happened was they ended up dropping the charges as they didn't want to travel in and out of the, what, at, of the state at the time to prosecute or testify, if you will. And that's ultimately what got Richard off early on that case. So he dodged a bullet, but that didn't stop him or teach him a lesson. He was subsequently fired, which uh, I hope. But then he devolved into murder. And now while this isn't his first killing, it was his first recognized killing. And this happened in June 28th of 1984. 79-year-old uh, Jenny Vencro was found dead, stabbed to death and nearly decapitated in her home. And his fingerprints were found on like a mesh screen window that he used to break inside. However, this was not his first kill, as I said before. What's really scary is that there was another death that was not, it was cold. It was a cold case that was linked to him in 2009 because his DNA was found. It was the, the killing of nine-year-old Mei Lung, which I really hope I pronounced that right. I am famous, at least I would say, for butchering names out of my ethnicity. Uh, he beat her and raped her and then stabbed her to death and hung her from a basement pipe. She Again, she was nine years old. And like I said, what's really scary about this is, other than the death in, you know, May being a child, is that there was a second sample of DNA actually found at the scene, and they can't identify who it's from, they just know it's from an un unidentified second male. And a lot of people have speculated this could possibly be Richard's cousin, which I would believe too, just based on their close relationship and their relationship with each other and indulging in grotesque, messed up shit. And I mean, they, they both got a history with that kind of behavior though, right? So. 
But again, that's all speculative. I can't say for sure. The cold case being solved in 09 is actually what prompted his wife, uh, Doreen Leoy, to divorce him. Yeah, that's right, guys and gals. Richard Ramirez was married up until 09 uh, <laughs> to a woman that married him in prison. Yeah, uh, he, had gr he had groupies since 96. That that's when they got married. He had groupies prior to this. He just uh, married the one that sent him over 75 letters. So yep, this trend of uh, fetishizing the Night Stalker was ripe and fresh when it actually happened and when he was arrested in the 80s. And so this is actually nothing new. And apparently for one woman, it's uh, you know it's a crossing a moral line for him to be killing and raping a child versus just all the other elderly people and everybody else he assaulted and all the stupid, terrible things he did. Because, you know, just it just makes sense, I guess. So yes, um, just just so to bring some clarification to all the people trying to defend the fetishization of serial killers, um, Richard Ramirez was a child predator as well. So please keep that in mind as well for when you're glamorizing this kind of person. Not quite. Not 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 cool. Also, dude, he's well, he looks weird. He looks look at look. He looks like a he looks like a garbage pail kid. He really does. But you know, he was six one. He was a tall motherfucker though. He was. Shit, a little shorter than I am. Uh, his former wife also stated that she would commit suicide once he was executed, as, of course, many of you know, Richard Ramirez got the death penalty. Uh, but, like I said before, she divorced him in 09, and that's when this little pact ended. Uh, like, <laughs> it's just crossing the line, I guess. You know... But after nearly a year-long rampage in California, including, you know, but after nearly a year-long rampage of crimes in California, including raping women, making them pledge their lives to Satan, ugh, carving pentagrams onto the corpses of his victims, ugh, cringe. Ugh, God. If you're gonna murder someone, at least not not make it so cringy. God, damn. On August 30th of 1985, Richard Ramirez took a bus to Tucson, Arizona, to visit his brother, unaware that he has become like the leading story on all California news articles and everything else. Like, he is the most wanted man, the enemy of the state right now. He had no idea. He failed to meet his brother, and you know, so the next day he went back to Los Angeles. Cool. The entire time. Einstein, who has no idea that he is the most wanted guy right now, walks past police officers into a convenience store who, uh, on their part, uh, good job, guys. Uh, and was just doing whatever the fuck he was doing, dicking around in there. And it was only when an elderly Latina woman started, like, muttering that it's El Matador, El Matador, or the killer in Spanish, I guess. He looked at a newspaper rack and saw his ugly ass face, and he, he booked it. He freaked out. Rightfully so, I suppose. He ran and tried to hijack a car, which failed. He was actually be beaten and chased by pedestrians, hopping fences, and failing two more hi hijackings before he was beaten to the ground and subdued by pedestrians. And basically, they just did a whole citizen's arrest on him, and they beat the tar out of him, including one lady hit him with a pipe, I guess. And serves him right. He was arrested and went to trial, and the first thing he does is raise the uh, hand when he went to go do his whole pledge to the uh, whatever, his, his oath on the Bible thing, and it revealed the, the famous pentagram picture, and he yelled, Hail Satan. Uh, how cult of him, you know? Like, so brutal. What really got spacey and just weird, though, is panic arose when one of the jurors actually turned up dead. She was shot to death in her apartment, and people started fearing that Richard possibly could have done this or know somebody who could have done this, and they, t and they were wondering what was going to happen to other jurors. But it was quickly revealed that it was actually the boyfriend of this woman, and he actually ended up taking his own life in a nearby hotel room. So, obviously, the trial went on, and... Well, he was convicted. He didn't really have a good defense despite maintaining his innocence. Uh, he was charged with five counts of attempted murder, 11 counts of sexual assault, 14 counts of burglary, and 13 counts of murder, and he was given 19 death sentences. Just in case the first death sentence doesn't work, give him 19! We don't want no evil cat man coming back from the dead either. 
or a vampire or whatever he is. However, it wouldn't be the Debbie Downer syringe or the electric hair salon chair that undid our beloved sex idol Richard Ramirez. It was actually lymphoma. Yes, he died in 2012 from complications of lymphoma, and he died looking like uh, some someone's stressed out elderly aunt who smoked cigarettes in her trailer in Florida, and that was pretty much the end of his story. He, I, he never expressed remorse for his crimes, and I, I, I think. My only theory on as to why he's popping up again, and it's quite the obvious one, is in 2020, you know, last year, a Netflix documentary came out about him, and I actually am thinking about watching it now just after doing this re research and this video, and I think that's what kind of just sparked the, you know, making all the girls' butts wet, because, like, that's what happens when girls get aroused, right? Their butts get wet? Right? But I don't know. I could go into detail on each case he did, and I know a lot of people are going to be disappointed that I didn't, but it really, it's not really worth noting. Uh, same tactic did it pretty much every time. It was just break in, rape, threaten, sometimes kill. Uh, there was times where he would make people, the women he raped. There was one case in he let the woman live, that if she begs and pledges her life to Satan, he'll let her live, and he did, like in, like, you know, the cool edgy, scary, sexy man he is, man, he just makes me, like, I bet he just smells like leather jacket and sex, like, holy shit, he bleeds so much testosterone out of all fucking two of his teeth he had left, that, I mean, I, I, I don't know, it makes my penis feel super small in his presence, just on the internet, I, I have to admit, like, I'm scared of, uh, I'm scared of being with a woman now that I know that a man like this existed, but, nonetheless, he's just kind of the typical scum of the earth, uh, he gained infamy because of his violent, like, year-long streak, and it was relatively consistent with, you know, breaking and or killing. Nobody was safe in their own home, and that was a really scary time, and he's also not the first Night Stalker, as I mentioned. He got his moniker after an older case for someone who was never caught, so needless to say, I mean, there's no real rationalization of people fetishizing him. It's just kind of what people do. It's nothing new. It's just more cancel culture friendly nowadays like people want to shun it i kind of want to shun it because i think it's ridiculous now well i'd be a liar if i told you i wasn't fascinated with serial killers and other cases like that otherwise i wouldn't run the channel the way i do however the reason i don't cover cases like this is typically people know these things a lot and i want to touch upon them in the more tasteful ways i can and give newer for at least fresher insider jokes or opinions on it so i mean if there are better known cases that you want me to cover please let me know in the comments below as well uh, one that is on my mind that I do kind of want to dive into that I've been thinking for Patreon is Edmund Kemper. And we all know about that thanks to like Mindhunter and other shows, but his case in particular has a lot of story and a lot to talk about. Richard Ramirez is really just... not a lot, I have to admit. I'm a little disappointed in this video, but I got a lot out. I got to talk about some things I wanted to talk about. No doubtably, uh, a lot of people are going to be talking about the recent changes to my channel and my myself right now that you can see. And I know I, it's pretty drastic, but I did rearrange where I put everything in here so it's a nice recording space. So I got a little more leg room, right? Really cool stuff. And I got a new mic, which I'm not using at the moment because I'm waiting for the little swing arm thing. So stay tuned. But this new mic, it's got a big old hot robot wiener, but very high quality, very, very nice, very cool, very legal. I'm very happy and excited to use it. Um, the art contest is still going on. I'm sorry I failed to blog about it, but so far so good. I'm very proud of everybody who submitted stuff. I am viewing them. I really like the stuff. Uh, please refer to my Twitter or other past videos and my pinned comments to get more details on that. Long story short, you can submit a art piece that's going to be used as a logo, possibly on merchandise and other products and things like that for my channel uh, to my business email or the, actually, I'm sorry, the whisperofmoths at gmail.com email. And for a chance to win $100, either to Venmo, PayPal, or a gift card of your choice. Uh, we're actually coming to the close of the contest. The contest ends on the 28th, and the winner will be announced on April 10th. So get ready for that. Um, definitely really excited, and, and that is also going to come with a rebranding of my intro and stuff like that. So for all the people coveting my intro song, I've already named it a few times. Uh, I'm not going to do it in the video. I'm just going to keep having people ask. <laughs> I'll leave it in my new video after I change it. Um, I didn't make it. It's royalty-free music, so... But anyways, 
thank you for watching please subscribe you know come down to the comments check out that preview for the infamous four which is my four-part series coming to patreon because youtube is sassy it won't let me talk about controversial topics apparently and again it helps me out quite a bit because now i can't even get tipped when i go live my tiktok got banned <laughs> i got a new one yeah man my kind of content just uh garners controversy i suppose it's no, it's no sweat though. You guys have been great to me. I, I cannot believe the love and support I'm getting from everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the cool, funny, and just amazing supportive comments. It's still so surreal to me to be in the position I'm in. I know to many, 5,000 going at 6,000 subscribers isn't a lot, but it was five months ago I was at zero and I had no idea what I was doing. I just think I, I thought I knew what I was doing and it's amazing to see my growth and you guys helped me a lot with my confidence and getting my potential out there. So I look forward to improving the channel further and further and growing with you guys. So definitely hop in the discord, chat with me sometime, throw some, you know, shoot the shit, shoot the breeze at me and let's talk about some messed up stuff and other silly stuff. We goof off in there a lot, but anyways, thanks for watching. Don't fetishize serial killers. It's not cool. Fetishize, like, I don't know. Like, train robbers for something. Okay, just something a little more chill, guys. Like, calm the fuck down. But, it's been real. I'm gonna, like, play with this for a minute. <laughs>